Well, good morning, church family. How many of you are bad? Raise your hand. Look at this. We have been learning things in the book of Romans. Uh, if you are new here or kind of catching up on the series, we're going verse by verse through the book of Romans. And you came on a really good day because the last couple of weeks have been really, really bad. Like not the church has been bad, it's been awesome. We've been seeing incredible things take place, salvations taking place, uh, incredible numbers. It's been really good in church, but we've been talking about the fact that people are bad. That's what we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks. But today we get to transition into the next part of the book of Romans. If you're ready for it, say, I'm ready. So the good news today is that while you are bad, Jesus is good, right? And your view of Jesus will change how you look at everything in this world. It matters how you view God. When you look at the relationship between God the Father and Son and Spirit and man, when you have that correctly in line, it is gonna change every single part about how you walk through your Christian faith. So today we're gonna to go through some, some really deep theology because the deeper our understanding of theology, the more we can appreciate the goodness of God. We're not gonna do shallow teaching here. We're gonna dive in deep. If you're ready for it, say, I'm ready. So sin is a global problem, right? Like it's everywhere. It's in my house, Lord have mercy. It is in our city, Lord have mercy. It's in our country, Jesus come. Y'all know Jesus is the solution, right? Like the solution is not the election. The solution is not behavior modification. The solution is not uh, solving uh, planetary issues. The solution is Jesus. Jesus is the solution. And while sickness is awful, Jesus is fantastic. He is the answer to everything. Jesus solves everything. Which is why, as a society, we're always looking for the superhero. Have you ever noticed that? Like, you take kids, and they tend to look up to people like Superman sometimes. Or uh, maybe the Incredible Hulk. I don't know if that's somebody's like favorite person right there. Or Thor or some others like that. And um, what's... Okay, I'm, I'm going to rant for a second right now because I feel like I can because I have the microphone. So um, one of the things that I'm working on with my kids is they have access to being able to watch YouTube kids, which like that's somewhat moderated, but somewhat not. And we check every single thing they could ever look on their device. We have every keystroke recorded. My helicopter parent, maybe, no, I love my kids. Like I want to know everything going on on their device. And so I'm watching some of the things that they're watching. And I noticed that as they're watching some of these videos, they began to see that life is so great for some of these kid YouTube stars. And they're like, man, their life is so awesome. They get to do this, they get to do that. That Their life is perfect, almost the superhero idol complex for them. And what they need to realize is that's only showing part of the perspective. That there's actually more going on behind that. There is sin and junk in every single person's life. Or you look at, um, I feel bad for some of these, these teenage girls right now as they see these pictures of all these Photoshop and filtered images and they'll never ever be that because it's fake. And so as a society, we have learned to want to obtain perfection, but the reality is, is that Jesus is the only one who is perfect. And so I want to pick up from where we were last week, we talked about Paul's big butt, if you were here. So if you know what I'm talking about, we talked about the sin of man for the first couple of chapters. Halfway through Romans chapter three, we get to this, but now. This is the transition point from the sinfulness of man to the goodness of God. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the prophets bear witness to it. I, uh, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And, and this is really, really good news because we know that the righteousness of God is available through faith in Jesus Christ. And that is what justifies us before a good living God. So in, in our world, uh, for at least the rhythm here in Virginia, what ended about two weeks ago? Anybody? Anybody? School, sickness, that'd be awesome if sickness was eradicated, that'd be wonderful. School, school ended, right? And if you go to school, um, and my kids don't know much about this because my kids are all homeschooled, but for the rest of uh, the population, you receive these things called report cards, right? How many of y'all love getting report cards? 
All right, I did not hang out with any of you when I was in high school. I was the opposite side of that, okay? I'm just going to say, like, graduated, uh, not a summa cum laude, but thank you, laude, like, barely made it through it. And so report cards give you an evaluation of how you're doing in something, like A, B, C, D, no E, because it could stand for excellence, and that would confuse people, and so we'd skip that one. we go straight to F. Like, you would, that's actually literally why they do not have an E in the grading system, because they thought in the 1930s people would think that means excellent. Now you know the answer to that question. But you get evaluated on your particular grades and you try to do things to make your grade perfect and to get as high as you can. And what happens is we take that mentality from high school and we go, well, if we have the right grades, then we can maybe make it to the right college. If we make it to the right college because college is clearly the answer for everyone. So if you get the right grades, you might make it into college and then you can get the right grades there and maybe meet the right person and get the right diploma so you can get the right job so you can buy the right house and buy the right this and the right that and retire. And we had this grading scale we use for all of humanity. And the problem with that is, is that the grading scale, if you were to hold your report card up to the standard of God, we are not good enough for it. The only way that we can get there is by the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. That is the standard for how we reach the promise of everlasting life. Now, in this, we're going to tackle a massive split that takes place in the church. So my daughter turned four years old yesterday. Oh my goodness. Happy birthday, Charlotte. You're somewhere back in Rise Kids, I'm sure, terrorizing all of the three-year-olds because you're big and four now. So we, uh, we love to decorate for birthdays, so we set up these streamers in front of her room. And she came right out of her room and ripped down the streamers in the middle, like dividing the streamers so she could walk through them. And th that idea of like ripping down the middle, this verse right here rips Christianity right down the middle. Because there's two main sides of Christianity, and this is extremely important. You have the Protestant side, which we would consider ourselves here Protestant, and then you have the uh, Catholic side of things on the other side. Two main splits, and it's like right down the middle, you could cut it, and there's two separate wings of how you can view theology. And so I want to give you these two terms right now. So there is the term that is called synergism. And the idea with that, and I know you guys love these Bible nerdy things right now, so get in my mind, enjoy this right now. So synergism, the idea of that is that it is the work of God along with the work of man that equals salvation, okay? The idea that there's this we thing going on. On the other end of the camp, you have uh, monergism, which is the idea that God does 100% of the work. Two completely different sides to it. So the Catholic Church would line up right here where the idea is that Jesus is the way, but there are things we need to do in addition to that. There are penances that need to be paid, or there are Hail Marys that need to take place, or confession to a priest that has to take place. And while I appreciate the position of priest, I happen to have a priest. He's the high priest, and his name is Jesus. So I don't need to go through another man. I have access to God himself directly through the Son of Man named Jesus Christ, and I'm thankful for that. So you have these two different theologies right here, and they, they really create a complete uh, division in the Christian faith. And I believe one of them is incredibly, uh, uh, is, is, is harmful, and I would say is actually heretical, and one of them is the proper viewpoint of it. So let me give you the official definition of it right now, that um, monergism states that the recognition of individual of, of the recognition, sorry, the regeneration of an individual is the work of God through the Holy Spirit alone, as opposed to synergism, which in its simplest form argues that humans will cooperate with God's grace in order to be regenerated. Regenerated is the process of becoming a believer in Jesus, having your soul regenerated. So I want to paint this picture for you. Um, I have many a baby, all five of them. My littlest is one, and he does not walk yet. He will at some point. And I'm scared for that day because he's wild like his dad. I mean, his mom. And uh, you ever see the parents that put their kids on a, on a leash? Like, we've not done that for any of ours. He might be the one that we have to do that for. So, just saying. So, if I take Noah and I set him right here, and he's hanging out and he's looking up at you guys with those blue eyes that are starting to change to uh, not blue, which is making my heart break. But he's sitting right here and he's looking forward. Um, for those of you walking online, you can't tell, but right here, there's a three-foot drop-off. Now, imagine that my one-year-old starts to crawl towards the drop-off. And I would say, Noah, don't do that. And he would look back and smile at me, which is the baby equivalent to the middle finger. 
And then he'd turn around and walk off the edge of it, right? Because he would walk, he'd try to crawl off because he's one and he's a sinner and Jesus loves him. So if he's walking this way, imagine for a second his father, I'm like, Noah, give me your hand. And I just waited to see what would take place. That would be very unloving of me, right? Because it would be putting the responsibility on a shared effort to have him be saved. A good father, rather than having the shared effort, I would actually walk forward and I would pick him up. Why? Because as dad, I have a responsibility to protect him. What you see in that is the difference between having a we do it mentality where there could be harm and a God does everything mentality. So going back to that previous verse, it is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. A big division right there in the church. God does 100% of the work. Going on to the second part of that verse, it says, for there is no distinction, which is tremendous news because we are about to hit the year of division right now. Elections coming up. Polarization is going to happen like crazy. When it comes to the gospel, there is no distinction. Doesn't matter whether you're black, white, rich, poor, whether you're tall, short, it does not matter any of those things. The grace of God is available to every single one of us. Now let's get into some of the fun stuff. Verse 23 through 26. For all have sinned. How many is all? All is all, y'all, right? 100% of us. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. Good news. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You notice this word right here, justified. That is the process of where you are Considered somebody who's fallen short. You are somebody who is separated from God. Justification is the process of going from somebody who is unsaved to somebody who is saved. It is a legal declaration that you are now a believer in Jesus Christ. How does that happen? It happens by his grace as a gift. It is not something that you earn. It's something that God gives through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation. Turn to your neighbor and say propitiation. That is such a fun word to say. And it is a massive theological concept that um, we're actually going to unpack right now. All right, I need two of my students right now. Aiden and Dylan, come on up. Give them a round of applause. All right, guys, come up right here. All right, you guys can go up the stairs. Sorry, we'll wait. You can just take your time. They don't even know. All right. Let's see. Do any of you have any money on you? No. Okay. So I'm going to give you a helmet. You can stand right here and you can come over here and I'm going to give you 20 bucks. Sound good? All right. Come stand right here. And you can stand right here and go and put this helmet on. So I used to ride motorcycles. Um, I, you look like you could ride motorcycles. Yeah. I, um, I no longer do it. And you're making me jealous just seeing you in that helmet right now. So I have really unfortunate news for you. If you have a helmet on, which you're not allowed to take off right now, but if you have a helmet, you are now going to be in prison for the rest of your life. This is a sad, I know, right? This is a sad day. Like, it's just a part of who you are. Like, you are one with this helmet, and the punishment is that for the rest of your life, you're going to be in jail. Now, the only way you can get out is if you have $20. You can't ask anybody, though. You can't go home. You can't talk to your dad. Your dad's got, got, got pockets that could probably help you out, but mm-mm, he can't help you right now. So right now, you are somebody who is just stuck with this punishment. Hold this thought. You're doing pretty good. Do you have a helmet on? No, you're free to walk around. You can go to anything. You can go to King's Dominion right now. Dylan can't because he has a helmet on. Everybody say, oh, so sad. So what happens now, what propitiation is, it's that while... You are not somebody who is guilty of it. You are willing to pay the penalty for what he has done. Even though you're not guilty of it, you are deciding that you are going to appease the punishment through the payment. So you can go and hand this to him right now. Look at this. Now you're free to go, right? Wonderful. Let's reboot this because it actually gets better. Come on back over here. So as the judge, Judge Michael, I'm the one who decides whether you have the $20. Not only are you the person who can make the payment, but come stand right here. You are the judge 
and the one who is able to make the payment for it, which allows you to be the one who can be the propitiation for the crime that he has made. Feel free to give him $20 and maybe you guys can split it sometime watching this payment take place. Your debt has been paid. Everybody celebrate the fact that Dylan is free to go. And I'll steal your helmet back from you. You can keep the 20 bucks. Yeah, really. He said, we have to split it. But this is what propitiation is. Whom God put... Now, how come y'all hustle back after I pay you? Come on. This is what walking in freedom looks like. You go a little quicker. All right. Whom God put forward as the propitiation by his blood. The, the, the payment for our sin, our inadequacies, for, for the mistakes that we've done, the, the, the payment for that is literally the blood. Rather than the $20 paying for the crime of being sinful, it is the blood of Jesus that does. And how does that happen? We receive it by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. And if you were somebody who grew up in Jewish culture, instantly your mind would go, whoa, passed over? That sounds like pass over. Because if you go back to the book of Exodus, you will see when the different plagues were going on in Egypt, the angel of death was going to take out the firstborn son of every single family unless they took the blood of the lamb and put it on their doorpost and the angel of death would pass over them. It was a foreshadowing of the passed over former sins. And that is good news for those that are in Jesus, that God has passed over every single one of our sins. Can I get an amen? All of this was to show his righteousness because God is a good God and a right God and a fair God. And so he knows that the penalty of sin is death. So he made a solution that his blood would be the propitiation to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. So propitiation, the definition would be appeasing the wrath of an offended person and being reconciled to him. So what happens here is that the, the payment of Jesus' blood begins to uh, appease the wrath of God, but it also reconciles us to him. It's two in one that takes place, which is such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Moving on to our last couple of verses in 27, it says, then what becomes of our boasting? What becomes of our boasting? It is very easy in the Christian faith or in life in general to boast on things that we might do. That we would come face to face with Jesus someday, which all of us are going to do. And we say, well, God, don't you see my, my perfect church attendance? Well, God, didn't you see my, my worship that I did? God, didn't you see that we cast out demons in your name? God, didn't you see my, my giving that took place? Didn't you see that, that I helped out the little old lady cross the street? All these things we can boast in, right? But it says, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. Like, like if Dylan was back up here, I'm not going to bring you up here, but let's say you're up here and you have your helmet on and the crime is a helmet. And I say, are you guilty of wearing a helmet? And you're like, I did the dishes last night. I'm like, no, are you guilty of wearing the helmet? And you go, I helped my dad weed whack the yard. Are you guilty of wearing the helmet? I, I took care of my baby brother who just celebrated his first birthday. Oh, so sweet. All of those things, while they're good works right there, and you could boast in them, that boasting does not exclude you from the penalty of wearing a helmet. In the same way, the, the, the boasting that we might do in our works doesn't exclude us from the sin that we might have. And, and so people will try to work their way through this, but the reality is it's not based on what we do. It's based on what God has already done. And then people will go, well, let's add some more to this because we want to figure out the works. So we go, well, is it, it, it what, what kind of law? Like if we do lawless works, will that help us out? Or by law of works? Uh, no, but by the law of faith. You see, here's where we get into some cultic faiths. And, and I, I'm going to paint with some broad strokes right now, okay? Which it's, it's dangerous to do, but, but I, I don't care. So <laughs> uh, men are stronger than women. It's, it's true. And I know one of you is going, well, my neighbor's daughter is a power lifter and she's stronger than you. And it's like, okay, I'm good for you and Olga. But like for the majority of humanity, men are stronger than women, right? Can we acknowledge that? 
Testosterone is a thing, bone density is a thing. There is a difference. It's a broad stroke. Sure, there are exceptions. I'm going to paint some broad strokes with the Mormon faith. I'm going to paint some broad strokes with Jehovah's Witnesses. And I'm going to paint some broad strokes with the Catholic Church. It got quiet right now. But, 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 but I, I want to be accurate to the text for a moment. Because if you were to go to the, the Mormon church, and we're going to go back to the 1830s where some 17-year-old named J Joseph Smith found some tablets and had special glasses and could read the whole thing, but then the tablets disappeared and it became a faith, and there's a lot of questionable things right there. And I have a lot of issues with the Mormon faith, like the fact that they believe that Jesus and Satan are brothers. And they're going, well, they believe we're all brothers. Well, if we're all brothers, then Jesus is not the only begotten son. Okay, so now we're messing with the deity of Christ. But, but even if we get past that and, and you go into that faith, it is the sacrifice of Jesus plus obedience and baptism into the Church of Latter-day Saints. That is how you are saved. It is Jesus plus something. So when we go right here, by what kind of law? By a law of works? Is it by a law of works? What does this say? No, 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 no. So that right there is a heretical version of Christianity. Again, broad strokes, can a Mormon be saved? Possibly, but by and large, that's a big issue right there. Now, what if we look at the, the Jehovah's Witnesses for a moment? And again, so some massive problems I have. They deny the resurrection of Jesus. Don't believe that actually took place. Um, they believe that the, uh, bl the, you receive blessing by your obedience, and that's how you get saved. It's through your actions that take place. That would be by the law of works. No, that's not how it works. When it comes to the Catholic Church, it's, it's Jesus plus something. And I'm looking right here and Paul is breaking this down so there's no confusion. It is Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. If you add anything to Jesus, you are now in a cult. Okay? If anybody's trying to sell you on something of Jesus plus something, that is not how it works. Paul lays it out so incredibly clear to us. Last couple of verses, then we're going to make it through chapter 3. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, the Gentiles also, saying the goodness of God and salvation is a gift to anybody that would believe in it, regardless of your ethnicity. Since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by faith. So no matter your background, no matter the behaviors that have taken place, it is by what? It is by faith. Turn to your neighbor and say, faith. It is by faith that one is able to accept the gift of Jesus Christ. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. And as the worship team comes back up, verse 31 is where this whole message becomes incredibly practical. Are you ready for the practicality of this? Say yes. Thank you. Help me out now. All right. Your salvation is not based on what you do. You have to get that. It's not based on what you do. It's based on what he did, right? So now what do we do with the Christian behaviors? So, the guilt can happen this way. You get saved, you become a believer. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so glad you saved my soul. The pastor told me to read my Bible. I'm going to pick a Bible plan on you version, and I'm going to try to do it. And then what happens is if you're like most of us, you're going to miss a day. Anybody ever missed a day of reading their Bible? Okay, for the rest of them, they're liars. They're going to hell anyway. So all of us have missed a day somewhere, right? Say yes. Yes, okay. When you miss a day, it would be easy for the conversation to be, Gosh, I can't believe I, I missed this day. I screwed up here. I dropped the ball right here. I wonder if I'm still saved. Ah, stupid Michael missed the day again. My Bible reading doesn't make me saved. It's not that I have to read my Bible. It's that because of the love of Jesus, I get to read my Bible. When it comes to getting baptized, which we're going to do in a moment, going in this water doesn't make you saved. And somebody's going, oh, I've never been baptized. This is so bad. I'm, 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 messing the, I'm missing the mark. This is not good at all. Oh, I feel so wretched about this. It's not about whether or not you have to get baptized. It's about the fact that now you get to be baptized, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Another misnomer in the church is that you have to serve to be saved. 
Your service will not save you. Jesus did. Jesus is the one who gives the gift of salvation. Now, because of what Jesus has done, do I have to serve? No, but I get to. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. We uphold these things. We move forward. We get to walk in the freedom of Christ, knowing there's nothing more we can do to disqualify ourselves because we're already as unrighteous. And there's nothing we can do to earn it. It's all based on God's goodness. And so that means for people like me and people like you, we can go, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that it's not based on my behavior. It's based on your goodness. And what I love is we've had the privilege of seeing people come to understand that knowledge that Jesus saves and that Jesus forgives and that he gives fresh grace over and over and over again. So I know I spent the first three weeks of this series kind of beating people up and smacking them around and I'm, I'm not sorry about it because it's Paul, not me. But now we get to go, man, there's great freedom found in Jesus. So last night at 1237, is that right? 1236, I'm looking over here, right here. I'm getting a nod, uh, a thumbs up. Uh, I don't know the exact time I could look. Um, I got a text message, which I did not read because I was sleeping because I like to sleep. And uh, so I woke up this morning and I, I saw a one of the greatest messages you can, you can read of a, of a mom texting me saying, me and my daughter were having this conversation about Jesus and she's ready to take the next step and she knows that Jesus died for her and she's accepted that gift of salvation and she's ready to go public with your faith. We're leaving town after service today. Is there any way you could do a baptism today before we leave? And I'm like, yeah. The Bible says that when somebody gets saved, when should they get baptized? Right afterwards. You don't need to wait 15 weeks to do a baptism. You don't need a three-month class to be able to do it. Let's just fill up the thing with water and get somebody dunked and have them go public with their faith. Amen? This should be a normal activity of the church is filling up the tank over and over and over again. And so um, I want to go ahead and invite the church to stand to their feet. Um, we have two sisters this morning that are going to be getting water baptized. So give them a round of applause. Two treadles. And uh, if you guys want to stand over right here, um, I'm going to try to thread a scriptural needle right now. Um, and all right. Since God is one, we're debunking the idea that God the Father and Jesus are separate entities. They are both God, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. Amen? So, God is one. Circumcision is not something we do in this church. And we probably shouldn't do it in this church. Can you imagine how awkward that would be if, like, we did an altar call? And we're like, you get saved, and people are like, yeah, I accept Jesus. They're crying. We're like, great. I got a knife. Drop your pants. Like, that gets really awkward right there. We're not doing that. But what it's showing, you're never going to forget this baptism. This is getting weird. This is getting weird, all right? Paul wrote it, not me. But what we see is that circumcision was a massive part of that culture. That if you were circumcised, you were seen as clean. If you were uncircumcised, you were seen as unclean. But it's saying here that the one who will be justified, they'll be justified, the circumcised by faith. So the clean one who's not really clean is justified by faith. The unclean one is also justified by faith. Either way, it's faith that saves you. So this baptism right here, I'm going to go ahead and take some scriptural leniency right now. This is not a real version of the Bible. I'm getting a point, okay? Got this? Not a version of the Bible. This is not the Bible. Who will justify the baptized by faith and the unbaptized through faith. That your salvation is not based on this tank. Your salvation is based on who? On Jesus. 
Your works cannot grant you salvation. It is your confession and belief in a God who loved you since the foundations of this world that makes you a new creation in Christ Jesus. And now, because of that, do you have to get baptized? No. You what? You get to get baptized. Can we celebrate that reality for a moment? <laughs>